What does hockey have to do with global history? Is it even possible to write a global history looking at a sport that one nation, Canada, seems to think is its own? Well, Dr. Andy Holman answered those questions, and he provided some pretty compelling evidence for, for his answers in a new book released just last fall called Hockey, A Global History, written by Dr. Andrew Holman, guest on the show today, and Dr. Stephen Hardy. If you're interested in hockey, of course this episode is going to be awesome as Dr. Holman is incredibly knowledgeable about the sport. He studied it, written a number of books on it, and clearly loves it. But if you're not so interested in hockey, it's just as relevant a discussion as it gets to the heart of some economic, social, cultural issues that don't necessarily fall neatly into national borders. It's a, it's a conversation that will definitely appeal to a wide range of listeners, as will the book, which you can find on hourofhistory.com. Go ahead, click the link, buy it, read it, you will not be disappointed, and enjoy the conversation. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. All right, enjoy everyone. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. With your host, Stephen Bauman, and producer, James Abel. The Hour of History is a member of Episodic Network, an association of fun, interesting, and informative podcasts. Episodicnetwork.com. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and with me is Dr. Andrew Holman, author of Hockey, A Global History. Welcome to Hour of History. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's very cool as someone who, you know, is a fan of hockey to see these sort of sports histories come out. Um, I've never been able to teach hockey, but I recently taught a global history of soccer course. And so when oh, I saw your book, I got really excited. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, Stephen Hardy, who was uh, my co-author on this book, originally started out this project in the late 90s, believe it or not. And then uh, when I met him in the early 2000s, uh, he asked me to come on board. And uh, it's a massive project. It's a, a monograph about uh, 486 pages, I think it is, of text. And um, it's meant to be comprehensive, although it can't be wholly contra comprehensive for given the breadth of the subject. But it's been a labor of love and something that uh, we've spoken about and worked on for for all of this time. And so we're we're thrilled to have it come out. Now we're in that sort of moment between the publication phase and waiting for the scholarly reviews to come out. So... <laughs> Bated breath, you know. Yeah. And can you tell um, people who are listening maybe how you came to study hockey? Sure. Yeah. Um, I did my uh, all my school and my uh, undergraduate and graduate work in Canada and wrote a very boring uh, <laughs> uh, dissertation that became a, an even more dull book. Uh, <laughs> I joke with my family because uh, there's something called the page 11 rule that I refer to, you know, each of my family members has a copy of my dissertation to book book in their, uh, in their bookshelves and to a person, they all have the bookmark at page 11, which means <laughs> I've done my due diligence. I've gotten as far as I can get with this, but there's too much theory and blah, blah. It was about uh, the formation of the middle class in Victorian Ontario towns. Hmm. And that might be exciting to, I don't know, maybe six people in North America. <laughs> in any case, um, when I took a job in the United States in 1996 at Bridgewater State University, Massachusetts, um, it occurred to me that, uh, that I might, uh, as the only Canadianist in the department, uh, that I might spread my wings a little bit and look for things that uh, would interest me, but also interest my students. And so I began to look at uh, subjects in the social history of Canadian-American relations uh, on borderland studies. And, uh, and one of those studies that I uh, did a, a number of studies about the celebration of the 4th of July and St. Jean-Baptiste Day on both sides of the border. Uh, and I stumbled across some material on, on ice hockey, and, or ice hockey as it's called down here, hockey as it's called in the United States. Mm -hmm. and uh, began to plug that into some of the larger discussions about Canadian-American differences and about borderland studies and 
about sport as a, a tool for negotiating uh, identity. And uh, I wrote a couple of articles. And one of those pieces that I wrote, actually, I presented at a conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is where I met Steve Hardy. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that to develop our relationship there. So, uh, wow. But at the same time, as I, I started writing scholarly stuff, um, I wanted to make sure that I incorporated my new interest and enthusiasm in my teaching. So not too long after that, I began uh, teaching a freshman writing skills and seminar that focused on hockey and focus. I offered it maybe six or seven times now. And uh, I've been accused of putting together a sort of a bait and switch. You know, the students look at it and say, oh, well, hockey, I'm going to take that seminar we're just going to watch hockey fight videos or study statistics or something. But, uh, it's really more about learning how to write and what makes effective writing for uh, young scholars. And uh, hockey just happens to be the vehicle then for leading to that goal. So I found a way to incorporate it into my teaching. I now teach um, uh, upper level courses and graduate courses in North American sport history and Hockey has a very conspicuous place in those, as you might imagine. Yeah, and and I think anyone who's taught one of those sort of or taken one of those high interest kind of classes that whether it be hockey or or something else, it, it always sees or hopefully learns eventually that that it's a it's quite a challenge to sort of get away from. Uh, Sort of, sort of the the fireworks of the show, and and dig down to deeper analysis. That's it. Yeah, I agree entirely, and that's really what the the big uh, you know it's sort of a, a two edged blade, right? And at one end, it's your it's inviting people in, and on the other side, it's trying to uh, take something that uh, lots of people think they know a good bit about, and then dissecting it in different ways, and so. Yeah, that's what I mean by a, a bait and switch, you know, uh, and I think our book does this too, in a sense that we try to speak to a scholarly audience, but we also try to open it up for the average reader who's interested in hockey history to say, look, it's not just about the rise of the NHL and the, the establishment of the great teams in North America. And, um, but there's, there's a lot going on down here too. If you, if you look at see how hockey expresses things like, uh, masculinity and masculinity crisis, how the violence in hockey is perceived by ordinary people and by and negotiated by its administrators and by the legislators, uh, and how it spreads. You know, it's not like, a, you know, a, an oil spill, for example. It doesn't just sort of spread in every direction. Uh, it, logically, it, it pops up in certain places around the globe uh, at certain times and for certain reasons. So yeah. there um, whether it's global diffusion or whether it's bigger social questions like that have to do with race and gender, you know, it, hockey is really a rich uh, field yeah. for looking at that sort of thing. And before we uh, dig down into any of those uh, specifics, the, the one of the cool things about the book is that it, it is uh, very accessible, and there's there's some lines um, right away that kind of uh, challenge these preconceived notions. One of them is is straight out. You say there there was no golden age of hockey or any other sport. Right. And I just kind of imagine, you know, uh, I mean that elicits a lot of reactions. Yeah, we well, kind of want golden ages. So what's what's sure the do. thinking behind this? Well, I, I I heard a sociologist say once that uh, everyone's golden age was when uh, he or she was eleven years old. Uh, that might be true. I'm not sure, but um, sure. I, I think that the whole uh, myth of the golden age in in any sport sort of hark, harkens back to a time when people think the sport was pure that it is now today they they think that somehow there was uh, an innocence in the sport that uh, uh, has been spoiled whether it's through money or scandal or uh, any of those uh, other kinds of things that have you know sullied the reputation of modern sport today Uh, but if we look back and we look hard enough we see that in virtually every generation there were the same kinds of controversies that existed, but also that, you know, contemporaries in the 1930s harkened back to the 1890s or the 1900s. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's uh, that kind of cycle or repetition 
And it kind of, uh, you mentioned it there, this idea of pure, and, and there's also the word that people love to use when describing uh, historical phenomena is uh, nature. Um, and, and you really sort of break those down and show how this sport was uh, socially and, and culturally produced um, going back to its earliest days. Uh, was there anything you found when researching, you know, sort of the origins of hockey that surprised you or that, that you particularly want to share? Um, I think what surprised me, and I'm not sure I can say this for Steve as well, but what surprised me was just how consonant the early, the first 20 years of hockey were with the broader history of Canada. You know, hockey is, uh, if you listen to uh, Canadian national uh, myth makers go on and on about hockey, they'll say, well, you know, hockey is a metaphor for Canadian life. And by that, they mean that, you know, it's a metaphor for a northern people who have conquered winter, in fact, have made a pastime out of winter. And it, it, it's far too saccharine to, to uh, really palate as a scholar, but it feels good as a, as a Canadian. Um, what's more true, I think, is that, is that hockey was a metaphor for and is a metaphor for Canadian history and that it contains a lot of the big themes that capture who Canadians think they are uh, and the stories that they've told about one another. And importantly, the real fissures that divided the country and continue to divide the country today. Hmm. So all you need to do is to look into hockey, for example. Uh, you know, hockey's founded, uh, at least the game that we can trace the modern day roots to, uh, is first played in Montreal on the 4th of March in 1875. And this is less than a decade after Confederation takes place and Canada is looking for things, symbols and myths and mottos into which uh, they can sink an identity. And then gradually from Montreal, it grows eastward and westward so that by the 1890s, it's truly a, a national game at the same time that the country physically is growing in the same dimensions as well. And so there's this kind of, you know, a uh, metaphor for national growth that, that is copied or that is replicated in the sport. But, but what we also point to in this book, uh, in the parts where we do deal with Canada, is that, um, you know, Canada is a remarkably divided country. It's a peaceful country. It's a country that has a wonderful standard of living for most of its people. Uh, but it is divided by region, and it's divided by race, it's divided in some ways by gender, and certainly by language, and all of those fissures are, uh, you know, make it loud and clear, are expressed loud and clearly in, uh, in hockey for sure. And as those uh, you know, divisions sort of emerge within the sport, we kind of have like this sort of um, Andersonian imagined community that develops uh, through through language and law and and media. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Sure. We'll start. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. I think um, um, I find yeah, the imagined communities concept to be a little uh, perhaps overplayed, and, mm -hmm. uh, but it's useful. Nonetheless, uh, still a useful concept. Um, you know, hockey is, uh, is certainly a place where the sense of, nation the sense of community gets imagined but it's not always uh, a, a sort of community that um, that is as inclusive as it might be um, so even as canadians in the late 19th and early 20th century are talking about how hockey's bringing people together from coast to coast they're talking largely about white people uh, and we have minorities and races who are excluded from the game in some places. And as we're learning now about First Nations people, particularly those who played hockey uh, in residential schools in the early 20th century, that hockey had this really kind of double presence. Okay, on one hand, hockey that is imposed by or uh, given to, depending on the verb you want to uh, use, uh, the First Nations students who were forcibly taken from their homes to come and live in these residential schools. It's an imperial imposition on one hand. On the other hand, it can be looked upon by the natives themselves who played the game as a sense of liberation or freedom or time out from the, 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 the daily um, rigor and uh, uh, imposition of a, of a 
of a schedule that wasn't their own or not of their own making. So community is useful, but it only goes so far. I think that we need to understand how um, hockey was employed as a, as a tool of separation in some instances. And I think that that residential schools uh, um, story is one of those, and that needs to be told further as well. Yeah, and this is kind of the great thing about looking at uh, something uh, as widespread as hockey, and and this certainly came up in discussions about soccer. Um, it it seems like in that last um, you know sort of explanation, you were you were moving between kind of a couple of the periods in the book from this innovation to a standardization. Uh, yes. And can you explain how does the standardization of sport kind of contribute to some of these myth making, the nationalism? Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, Lord Stanley. Things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think the standardization happens in virtually uh, every sport, and it happens at about the same time. It's the, the final third of the 19th century that, for most modern sports, we see this kind of uh, codification, if you want to call it that, of rules. Uh, and the determination then that uh, there's only one version that really matters, whether it's American football or whether it's hockey or whether it's you name it. And uh, that happens. Mont the Montreal founding is the moment then when we see the beginning of this standardization. Uh, the standardization happens not all at once. It's not one explosive moment when, you know, the rules are etched in stone. There's some experimental period that happens in the 20 years or so after that. Well, actually, you might say that it's continued even to the present day. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the powers that be in the NHL continue to tinker with rules about, uh, uh, about penalties, et cetera, and, right. and uh, uh, equipment size, all that sort of thing. But the big major changes that happen happen in the 20 years or so after the founding uh, Montreal game, Victoria Rink in 1875, what happens in following that is um, a real big moment in hockey history, which is a series of about six years when something called the Montreal Winter Carnival uh, takes place. And Montreal had had a struggling economy for uh, a few years before that. And so uh, its town fathers thought that the best idea to address its economic woes was be to invite the world to come to Montreal uh, in the winters and <laughs> engage in uh, you know, uh, tobogganing or, or uh, snowshoeing or and other things, including ice hockey. And so in, from 1883 until 1889, we have these successive years where uh, hockey has a prominent place then in Canada's biggest city's winter carnival, and it catches on. The game uh, spreads beyond the city of Montreal. It's taken there by people to Ottawa, to Quebec City, and to other small towns uh, in the regions. But the focus on that tournament becomes so important that by 1886, the players on the teams look at one another and say, hey, let's establish some perennial league or association. They do that in 1886, and it's called the Amateur Hockey Association of Canada. And it's those games that are played uh, regularly that become the height of the game, played by its best athletes uh, and understood for their prowess. Now, in 1889, one of the most important things, it's the last year of the Montreal Winter Carnival in that decade, but it's also a year that the Governor General uh, of Canada, Lord Stanley, decides to visit. And he's taken quite uh, impressively with this sport. Uh, and so uh, in uh, 1892, he decides that he's going to uh, donate uh, a, a trophy, a bowl, a cup, or uh, the, the Dominion's top amateur championship team, which was the winner of the AHAC. And that comes about in the spring of 1893. So this, this kind of um, standardization of the rules then is actually uh, codified, but also given a royal stamp. Mm -hmm. And in the late 19th century in Canada, to have uh, anything regal associated with what you're doing was uh, the, probably one of the best honors that you could have. And it means that you're a legitimate enterprise.
Yeah, and so wow, and and in just in that sort of snippet, you get all of the the kind of uh, what you describe as the motors driving this, where there's there's the production of the events, the distribution, more people doing it, people are starting to consume and to watch these yeah. events, and then the the significance is stamped on by by official uh, sort of you know government. That's right. And uh, it becomes this kind of uh, leaping off point then for sport, this sport to be the Montreal game to be spread to the rest of Canada into the United States and, and then actually through the Stanleys uh, over to uh, Britain. Uh, but it, in the process of it leaving Montreal, and this is a story we tried to tell, it, it's, it's fundamental characters. Yes, the hockey's still played by the same rules with the same equipment, uh, but its character and its meaning becomes transformed by that uh, by the vectors that it follows outside of the, the city. So uh, for the first 20 years or so, hockey had been associated with bourgeois Montrealers, Anglophones in particular. And so uh, for these folks who followed the old, uh, you know, rules of gentlemanly conduct when it came to playing sport, those codes of conduct that were uh, first put in place and uh, British public schools in the mid 19th century. Um, these were the sorts of people who played for fun, that hockey should only be played by amateurs, that there should be no kind of material gain or goal at the end of the, of the match or the end of the season. But it's transformation, it's, it's distribution outside of the city of, Mon uh, of Montreal means that the game becomes increasingly played by ordinary folks, working class people, it uh, didn't matter whether you were um, uh, workers on the railway or if you were uh, streetcar workers, if you were bank clerks, ordinary folks in towns and cities across Canada begin to take up the game with relish and uh, play it in different ways and for different reasons. Mm -hmm. It's not long before uh, hockey follows familiar patterns that took place in baseball in America, for example, where uh, the desire to win meant you wanted to get the very best players and to get the very best players, then, of course, you had to pay them. And uh, a period of what's called shamateurism, sham amateurism, has its uh, its place in hockey history in the 1890s and, and early 1900s. Did you, did you follow or did you find that sort of, there, especially when people study sports, there's this um, tendency to want to put it into a comparative sense. Uh, did yes. you find that happen often? <laughs> I don't see that as much. Maybe the literature isn't as, uh, as uh, robust in uh, hockey, uh, scholarly hockey literature as it is in others, but um, you can't help but do that. Steve and I do that a little bit in, in hockey, a global history, but, you know, hockey and baseball and hockey and uh, American football, for example, while they have general similarities in terms of timelines, uh, they're quite different. So. And the decision uh, uh, to make it a global history, we really see in the period that you just described how it's, it's you know, not confined to any national border, yet the next section is, you know, Canada's game. Right. So right. can you talk a little bit about that contradiction, how at the same time we have a very serviceable, like, uh, cultural study that is global and it's also a really good tool to look at national identity right so the the watchword here is is asymmetry uh and that you know hockey spreads but it doesn't spread evenly and it remains very thick on the ground in canada and for geographic reasons for cultural reasons uh hockey becomes embraced by canada and canadians in ways that are much deeper and fuller uh, and, you know, uh, lustily embraced than they are in the rest of the world. So hockey becomes this kind of gift, quote unquote, that mm -hmm. Canadians have given to the rest of the world. Uh, and it's only in recent years, I think, that we can begin to see that uh, there's been something of a decline, not just in Canada, but also uh, in, in, in the ability of Canada to dominate the game vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that, that they used to do. But to get back to your question, there is this kind of uneven spread that takes place. Um, it doesn't, hockey gains uh, a following and gets rooted in certain parts of the United States early, 
uh, but it doesn't have anywhere near the kind of appeal that baseball would have or that uh, uh, later, much later basketball would have. And in Europe, it, it remains a kind of a, uh, a marginal sport, even though in places like France and Sweden and Bohemia, as it was called, even Italy, England, of course, national organizations are created and an international ice hockey federation was established in 1908. Uh, so there is certainly a, a critical mass of following, but it never really matches and arguably still doesn't match the kind of depth of following and the richness of meaning that the sport has in Canada. Hmm. So that kind of, that's the bigger map, if you want to call it that, of hockey as a global history. It remains a global history, of course, but like so many global phenomena, it, uh, it's not as if it's experienced in similar ways or with similar depth everywhere you go. Uh, c- counterfactually, if, if there had been the sort of technology, you know, to have an ice rink in Dubai and, you know, you can watch hockey in Southeast Asia, do you see hockey perhaps spreading differently? Wow. Counterfactual <laughs> history. Yeah. That's, that's um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, um, uh, we like to tell ourselves, or certainly Canadians like to tell themselves that, you know, that hockey's truth, if you want to call it, that is rooted in Nordicity. But we see more and more these days that that's, that's not quite the case, and ironically so, right? One of the very best players in the National Hockey League was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we fall all over ourselves in, in, in celebrating and enjoying the outdoor games at the NHL stages every year. And yet, for the most part, most of those players probably grew up 99% of the time in their youth playing hockey indoors with artificial ice and heated, uh, you know, heaters for the stands, that sort of thing. So uh, the kind of organic uh, claim that Canadians have for, for hockey is really quite mythical. Um, could it have happened? To, of course it could have happened. To, <laughs> you know, that's the nature of history, right? We, but uh, why it happened the way it did is really, uh, is really what this book is all about. Yeah, and and that's fantastic. And uh, how's that for dodging your question? Yeah, I know. The, the, the <laughs> his, historians never go uh, fortune telling, unfortunately. But sometimes I can tease other other disciplines into it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, and I find a lot of parallels in it, and it is interesting to think about, especially because I I'm from California, and mm-hmm. I was kind of a product of that. Let's teach them to play roller hockey, and then we'll get them on the ice. Idea. Um, so, so I find that very interesting. Um, well, let's talk about the Cold War first before we get to economics. Um, Russia, Soviet Union, uh, and Canada, you know, both have these incredible traditions that sort of converge. Uh, mm-hmm. And can you talk about that a little bit? This this sure. idea that maybe, uh, or you know, this our reality check Canada gets, I guess. Right. So the Cold War is really important because what it, it's the, the one time in history when, when foreign policy and the playing of hockey become very, very closely aligned. And both uh, countries like the Soviet Union and Canada, and of course we know the United States as well with the miracle on ice, uh, can't help but look at, at their national teams as being uh, proxies for this, their part in the larger Cold War, right? The reflections of their ways of life. And so... Uh, wins and losses as a result mean much more than they they probably should have and much more in other contexts. Uh, between Canada and the Soviet Union, uh, there is developed a very deep rivalry. And it's, it's interesting. It's almost like a sort of rivalry that grows up between Britain and the United States economically. If Britain is the first industrial country, the first industrial nation. There's something about being first at it that gives you a crown in the whole field, but it also hobbles you in terms of uh, your willingness to change your ways, your willingness to uh, uh, develop new strategies and tactics. Canada, of course, the home of hockey and also the home of hockey hubris, if you want to call it that. Uh, So that when the Soviets decide that they're going to join, they're going to start playing hockey and abandon their – 
game bandy in 1946. Uh, and that not only are they going to start playing hockey, but they're going to play it at the highest level and they're going to show the rest of the world through victories in hockey, just as they do in other uh, sports that uh, the communist way is best. It creates uh, quite a, 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 an interesting sort of contrast then. The Soviets do exactly what they say they're going to do. By the end of the 1950s, they're world champs. Uh, they have become... Uh, uh, perennial favorites in international competition and Canadians um, sort of lick their wounds a little bit when they lose. They first lose in 1954 when they sent uh, a senior B team to go and uh, mm. carry the banner for, for Canada. Uh, but into the 1960s, this becomes a more and more of a sore point. And Canadians argue, if only we could send our very best players uh, to play against their very best players, then we might, uh, we'll show them really uh, who is the king of hockey. Uh, they couldn't, of course, because of amateur codes, right? To be, uh, to play internationally uh, with International Ice Hockey Federation sanction or even Olympic sanction, you had to be an outright amateur, not being paid for uh, in, in any way or remunerated in any way for your, your contribution. And the Soviets got by on that, saying all of our players are amateurs. Mm -hmm. They're all, you know, or a good many of them are in the army. They just happen to, their jobs in the army just happen to be <laughs> playing hockey, right? But for Canadians, you know, uh, since the 1930s, when the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association allowed the National Hockey League to reach into amateur ranks and to, to sign uh, amateur uh, players to future contracts, something called a C form. Um, it meant that at least in name, uh, their very best players were uh, considered professionals and couldn't play internationally except through some sort of special arrangement. So by the late 1960s, it became imperative in the minds of some Canadians and, and people like uh, Alan Eagleson and uh, Clarence Campbell and others to try to negotiate with the Soviets to have this showdown once and for all. And of course, what happens in 1972, this is one of the key years that we cite as being a, 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 a point of a period change when convergence begins to take place, uh, in part because of the summit series that happens in 1972. Four games played on Canadian soil in early September 72, and then four games played in Moscow at the Lizhniki uh, Arena Ice Palace. Uh, it didn't turn out, uh, I suppose in the long run, it turned out the way that Canadians expected, but the uh, road that they got there wasn't anything anyone expected. Mm. Uh, finally, the Canadians win, but only in, in uh, game eight with uh, a goal scored by Paul Henderson, uh, 34 seconds left, I think it was. And I remember, I'm one of the many... Uh, Canadians who remembers where he was when that final goal was scored. We were all uh, in classrooms or, or in, uh, for me, it was a gymnasium where the, the, our school principal had gathered all of us to come and sit and watch the final game. Most of us not knowing why this was important, <laughs> knowing that it was hockey and it, it beat sitting in class. So uh, we watched it. But uh, yeah, the Cold War then establishes this kind of framework or a new sense of meaning. Uh, and, uh, and the Canadian-Soviet uh, rivalry develops gradually over the 1950s as more and more uh, Soviet teams rack up wins and into the 1960s. Canada tries in, in the, the 1960s to develop a new national team program that's going to involve pure amateurs who are a perennial team rather than just choosing all-stars like they used to that didn't work. And in the end, that fails too. So we end up by 1972, with this grand realization that, in Canada anyway, Canadians said, yeah, see, we are still the best. Hmm. Uh, but at the same time, not too long after that thought, it was very close, closely followed by a second thought, which says, yeah, but we're not the best by very much. Hmm. And uh, something has to change in terms of our style and tactics. And so that's why 1972, in part, for a number of reasons, but 1972 is an important date. It signals the opening up in, uh, of the Canadian mind and of North Americans' minds hmm. to the need to change the game, to reduce violence in it. That comes much later. But to adopt uh, European strategies, particularly Soviet strategies, 
for attacking and defending. And this also sort of uh, opens, uh, however you know small it is, it, it opens a sort of corporate gateway too, because the the series is is televised and there's ads. Um, right. So I mean that's kind of. I just returned from Cuba and you, you still, do, there's no ads in the country and it's just kind of this extraordinary thing to even ponder now. Right. Um, but there were no ads in the Soviet Union. And then this is like the first kind of step into this corporatization as well. Sure. And uh, the bulk of the ads on in uh, the Luzhniki ice arena were uh, North American ads aimed at the North American television audience for that, that series. Mm -hmm. So here we've got this sort of global reach. It's not just commercialism, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transatlantic uh, reach that's taking place as well. And uh, that's impressive. And it's not just, uh, uh, you know, advertising beer or other things like that. It's actually the, the, the material culture of the game becomes so, mm -hmm. uh, commercialized as well. So in the 60s, but particularly in the 70s and 80s, we begin to see the the rise of big corporate enterprises whose um, principal goal is to provide hockey equipment to willing players. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah on, on many fronts, then this, this corporate element starts to invade. And it's interesting, you know, we've been talking about a lot of, uh, you know, basically the history of hockey that we're up into the seventies and, and the NHL hasn't featured a whole lot in the discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's by design. Uh, yeah. I think it's true in the book that uh, um, we don't we don't speak about the NHL perhaps as much as some would expect us to. Um, in part because there's a good many writers, most of them not scholars, but but writers who cover the history of the NHL, and uh, the NHL certainly has its place. Um, it, it is a massive power broker. Uh, a massive locus of power uh, in the hockey world. It is the gold standard, if you will, of the game, and also a big commercial colossus that dominates the game. But it's had the tendency in the past to, to uh, uh, I think, uh, overshadow and to silence some of the quite interesting stories that exist in the game. In fact, uh, that's one of the goals of our book is to try to give voice to the game that, that is played outside of the bounds of the NHL or the NHL's control. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, I think, you know, where you find interesting stories about women's hockey, about uh, African Americans playing uh, hockey and uh, about the game as it's played in Europe, for example. Uh, all of those are missed in any standard history of the national hockey league. Yeah. I mean, it is certainly interesting. Um, and that's, you know, I'm thinking back now to when I first went to the, the Hockey Hall of Fame and what really caught my uh, attention there was the, the international exhibit they had. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah. kind of, you see the jerseys of these nations that were like playing hockey way before you kind of think about them or, you know. Um, right. Yeah, so I think that is, that is a, an interesting point. But, um, you, you know... On that, on that point, there's, yeah. there's a really interesting moment that... Um, we we talk about. And I suppose if we had more space, we could even uh, we could even talk about it further. Which is the 1920 Olympics in Antwerp in Belgium, mm. when when hockey appears on the Olympic platform uh, as an experimental sport. It's not until 1924 that it becomes fully embraced in the range of Olympic sports. But here, the teams that show up. If you were to look at the difference between the size and the material culture that's brought by the United States team that's bought, brought by the uh, team Canada. And then look at the pictures of the Swiss team or the Swedish team and see the kind of, um, uh, you know, combination of old bandy sticks and soccer mm -hmm. shorts. Uh, it's really quite arresting that, uh, you know, they're what each of these countries thought of as ice hockey is, um, uh, is brought to the fore and contrasts greatly at that moment. Of course, after the 1920s, that begins to, into the 1920s, that begins to change. It begins to change right at that moment. One of the things that the Americans and the Canadian hockey teams do is to leave all of their gear behind for hmm. uh, other teams so that uh, they'll see this is, you know, how 
North American hockey, the gold standard gets played. And, uh, and they don't make that mistake again. When they come back in the 1924 and again 1928, the teams are a little bit better, but they're much better equipped as well. Yeah, I, I thought that was a really interesting part because a lot of um, the sort of sports histories that you read or the classic example always goes to Mussolini's World Cup, um, yeah. and, and which is a great example of kind of the sports nationalism and, and things like that and, you know, what he did to get Italy to, to, to be successful. But, but these kind of things have roots that go a, a bit deeper. That's right. That's yeah. Right. Um, so now moving on, you know, more to the present, uh, up until the late 1960s, uh, you give the statistic that 98% in, uh, in 1967, 98% of the NHL is Canadian players. Yeah. yeah. And then somehow by 2001, it's only 53%. Yeah. So w what are some of the steps that, that kind of lead to this globalization of, of, of this what was a Canadian enterprise in North America? Well, I mean, if it was Canadians uh, wish to share their game with the world, they might have succeeded too well. In that. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, right? Yeah. Um, well, no, I think that this is uh, this is a, an artifact of of this bigger process of globalization that takes place, um, and it happens. Uh, in this final period that we look at 1972 to the present day, or just about the present day, a, 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 an era that we call convergence mm -hmm. and convergence in a couple of different ways. It's not just that uh, more and more Europeans, European coaches uh, are uh, coming to North America, which they are both at the professional as well as the junior level at coaching clinics and bringing their ideas about uh, attacking and defending, bringing their ideas about game organization uh, to uh, to ears that are increasingly open, but the North American game is being uh, looked upon, is being spread even more so in Europe as well. And so, uh, it's no uh, coincidence that after the 1972 series, which many people felt the Canadians won because of <laughs> talent as much as as anything else, uh, that the European game in the 1970s and in the Soviet Union even becomes uh, more physical. Mm. Uh, and, and so there's this exchange that's taking place, uh, this, this cross-fertilization, if you want to call it that. And so what that means is that uh, as the game becomes more global, then the bases from which the top talent is going to be recruited becomes more global too. Little story, uh, in, uh, in the United States, for example, and the U.S. is... Uh, has significantly risen in the number of percentage of players that it provides to the National Hockey League. You know, before, before let's say 1970, the central goal, if you were a, a youth player here, or a university player, was to um, either play for your national team or to aspire to play top level senior hockey. Um, that's not the case anymore. And what happens, it's brought about because uh, of a couple of things. Number one, in 1973, uh, the rules are changed in the, the NCAA, which allows body checking all over the ice, not just in your defensive third. And to make the jump then from a junior or college ranks and play in the pros, uh, physicality is really a, a big, and it was considered a big thing by general managers and coaches at the time. So there was this kind of Skepticism, deep, deep skepticism. Not to say that no NCAA players could play in the pros, because they did. People like Keith Magnuson did. Mm. But they were skeptical about the ability then for American players to make the jump. Well, after 1973, that's no longer an issue. And the NCAA then opens up the possibility of college hockey here to be a richer recruiting ground for pro players. Mm. And it does, you know, and th th what happens by the end of the 1970s is that increasingly American players prove that they can play at the top level. The mm. best proof in the pudding is, of course, the miracle on ice in 1980 in Lake Placid, mm -hmm. where this team of college and ex-college players and minor pro players somehow bring down the most, uh, the most talented team in the world. Mm -hmm. So since then, uh, in the United States, certainly, the goal is, yes, want to play for my national team for sure, but 
there seems to be for youngsters today and in for the past generation or so, no kind of obstacles, whether physical or, or mental, uh, in, between them and an NHL career. Hmm. Uh, I suspect that a similar sort of thing has happened in Europe as well, where the NHL is looked upon increasingly as, a, as, as doable, as viable, as something that can be reached. Hmm. And the college system versus the, the junior system in mm -hmm. uh, Canada is, you know, it's a really interesting comparison because we don't get that in other North American sports to the same extent. Right. Um, for people who don't understand the, the college or the, I'm sorry, the junior system, the major juniors and things like that in, in Canada, could you just briefly describe that? And because people have been kind of talking about alternatives to, to college sports for a long time in the United States. Right. Uh, but it's not all pretty. No, no, it's not. In fact, it's, it has been in the past quite abusive, although mm -hmm. it's, it's changed to, it's changed for the better recently. So junior hockey has existed since the 1890s, and it was part of the growth of the game where um, in organizing the game, then age gradations made a lot of sense for organizing youth hockey, uh, junior team, intermediate team, senior team. Uh, and juniors have uh, for the longest time been 20 years of age or, or under. Um, and they have been in Canada – uh, the main recruiting ground then for professionals who would go into the National Hockey League or into one of the minor pro uh, leagues, a primary labor pool, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. for recruitment. And um, these were the, the people who I spoke about earlier. In 1936, the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association signed an agreement with the NHL that allowed the NHL to reach into uh, amateur hockey and principally junior hockey. And they did this in a couple of ways. They would go and they would find individual junior players who they thought had great promise. If they were over 16 years of age, then they would, uh, uh, they could sign them to a C form, which said that they would be the property of that NHL team, uh, hmm. indefinitely. Uh, and if they were less than 16 years of age, then they had to have their parents sign. I think Bobby Orr was 14 years of age when mm. his parents signed a contract with uh, the Boston Bruins organization. So you can see how this could be open for abuse, and it was. Mm -hmm. Not just, uh, you know, signing somebody to a contract before he was of an age to determine what the heck he wanted to do with his life anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but also because it meant before the age of um, – a free agency that you were the property of a professional hockey team in perpetuity. If you wanted to play pro, you had to play for them. So junior hockey then from early days uh, has been uh, this kind of recruiting ground that's been, you know, uh, fraught with uh, potential for abuse. Um, if you played junior, major junior hockey, and this was a distinction that began to take place in the late sixties, uh, it meant that pretty much from 16 years to 20 years, hockey was your job. You might have gone to high school on the side or you might have taken a few college classes here or there. But you were expected by these major junior enterprises, which are all private businesses, hmm. to, um, to have as your number one uh, uh, priority to be playing hockey and training uh, for hockey games. Uh, so what it meant was that uh, you ended up with a lot of kids who – at the end of their junior days, they might have been drafted by a team, but their tryouts didn't work out, uh, were left uh, without a pro career and, uh, you know, without an education. And so this became somewhat of a crisis then in junior hockey. One uh, president, uh, sorry, secretary treasurer, a guy called Gordon Jukes, who for a long time was secretary treasurer of the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association, called the system hockey's gigantic slave farm. Whoa. Yeah. And in the, in the view of uh, long-term uh, New York Rangers um, journalist, Stan Fischler, uh, he wrote an interesting little book that not very well read, but, uh, or widely read uh, called uh, up from the, up from the miners hmm. in 1971. Uh, he made the claim that this system could never have existed in the United States, that this was, 
truly a Canadian creation because of the Canadians were hoodwinked in a way by their love of hockey huh. and by uh, their reverence for NHL teams. So uh, happily, more recently, things have changed. The major junior system is still in place, but uh, all of the three major junior leagues in the Canadian Hockey League the uh, Quebec Major Junior Hockey Association, which covers Quebec and the Maritimes, the Ontario Hockey League, uh, and the Western Canada Hockey League. They all have scholarship programs in place. Uh, these juniors uh, uh, who play major junior are considered professionals, so they can't, they can't play NCAA after they've started playing uh, uh, junior hockey there. But in place of that, uh, what the junior leagues up there have done is to offer – uh, books and tuition money for every player on a per year basis. So if you played one or two years uh, major junior hockey, then you're eligible for a scholarship that will pay for one or two years of university uh, for you after your playing days as a junior are over, which is a really neat demographic thing as well. I know I'm going on with the answer, but um, you find now that uh, university hockey in Canada is populated almost wholly by former major junior players hmm. who at one time were considered professionals. Now they're back into the amateur ranks uh, and they're playing on scholarship money that has been uh, uh, provided by the, the major junior leagues. And they're well on in their years. You know, they're in their mid or, or late twenties by the time they're, they're finished their undergraduate education. So, but and then the university sport then doesn't have as much of a following, or is it still kind of? Uh... No, it doesn't have as much of a following. Mm -hmm. Although in some places, on some campuses in Western Canada, in the times, for example, you would uh, you'd find a, a packed house toward the end of the season around playoff time. Uh, it's still very, as you can you can imagine, if it's made up of former major junior players, it's very highly competitive mm -hmm. uh, hockey. Uh, but but full of people who know for the most part, not everybody, but almost everybody who know that they're on the downside of their career. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's a very interesting topic. Um, we should continue on, though. I'd like to talk a little bit about... Uh, you know, not for hope. I mean, there's so much in this book. Like, I I think the listeners are getting a sense with, with how how much information is there as as we skip decade sure. by decade. But um, I'd like to jump to sort of the the contemporary corporatism and the the recent lockouts, um, mm -hmm. where where you show that this there's just a total breakdown. Um, and we see it in a few places. We see it both with the lockdown, lock, lockouts, and we also see it in the Olympics and, you know, this professional amateur thing that's been going on. So maybe you could start with the lockouts and what they tell us about the game um, and then move on from there. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think the lockouts tell us uh, where, the, where the power lies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, hockey, the way it's organized, uh, organized these days. Uh, and that resides with... Uh, the NHL, and particularly the, the commissioner, Gary Bettman, mm -hmm. who has been successful in uh, using lockouts to renegotiate the, the deal he has with um, NHL players. So uh, lockouts are telling. They're telling uh, not just for what they say about the arrangement of uh, corporate and enterprise and the upper hand that's held by management here, uh, but they're also telling for what they say about, about followers of the game. Uh, ordinary folks who uh, might, you would think, be so angered by this kind of corporate manipulation of their game, quote unquote, that they might uh, put their dollars and their interest elsewhere. Uh, but they haven't. In fact, there's a kind of an am amnesia, I think, that's settled in in the hockey world among fans. Um, just bring me the entertainment and, uh, hmm. and uh, no penalty will come for, you know, uh, any kind of shortage of that because of the lockout. Hmm. I think that's especially true in, in its hot, in its hotbeds. If you look at Toronto or Montreal or New York city, um, I was told not too long ago that it's many years now, uh, uh, waiting in line for, um, season tickets. If you wanted to purchase season tickets there. So yeah, considerable it patience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that kind of leads to the question then of like, 
and and this is a central question to to the whole book is is this question of of whose game is it right and and you talk about some of the leagues that spring up like the LGBT league in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and women's leagues you know so so there are kind of changes that have happened throughout but um, where where do you now this is another one of those look into the future questions yeah. um, are you pessimistic about this question whose game this is the beautiful thing about sport isn't it is that as much as any kind of corporate entity or any kind of organizational entity tries to grasp and hold it or any nation tries to grasp it and claim it as its own it's too slippery and it uh, it can and does uh, uh, belong to everybody uh, we've seen this question about whose game get asked and answered and asked and answered mm -hmm. over uh, several generations in which hockey has existed. It's been asked uh, on the question of race. Hockey is one of the whitest games that you'll see uh, played on television or anywhere. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, there have been significant episodes where uh, African-Canadian uh, uh, First Nations uh, players and teams have been organized and claim the game as their own. Uh, it's also true of women's hockey. And uh, there's a little story in here about women's hockey. Of course, women's hockey uh, uh, being played in Europe, that women uh, are strewn through this whole book. Uh, and we, we talk about the ups and downs of women's hockey um, across the decades. But uh, for a game that you know first was played by women in the 1890s, it has this kind of weak or novelty quality to it until the 19 teens. Then in the late 19 teens, there's this burst of effort in uh, Canada, across Canada and Ontario and British Columbia, uh, also in the United States in Philadelphia and Boston, where for at least a short moment, 1916 to 1923, uh, we see a real avid following. But this whole question when women play the hockey game is, is, is this hockey? Is this the, the sort of um, uh, imprint, the, the combination of speed and science and mayhem that uh, men made it out to be when they created it in the late 19th century? And so, that, I mean, that's a question that, that still gets asked, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll continue to, to, to play that that game i'm not sure <laughs> in in the 1920s and 30s hockey for women in canada really sprouted uh, a dominion championship was played all across the country and in certain places like preston ontario and in edmonton and in montreal there were really good women's teams uh that were perennial com perennially competitive and and took home the honors Interesting story about what happens, though. It, no one has told the story before about uh, ice hockey for women in France and Britain mm. in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, hockey had been played by women uh, since the early 20s in France, both in Paris and up in the uh, Alps at the Alpine uh, resorts, uh, and also starts to get played in uh, southern England, uh, particularly the southeast and in London. So there are these two cultures, and in fact, for a time between 1926 and 1938, there is this cross the English Channel rivalry between French hmm. teams and English teams that uh, uh, achieves quite a bit of press, actually, in both France and in the UK, uh, and develops its own kind of culture in this period. Hmm. Of course, the Second World War, unfortunately, puts a big damper on it in the UK, and in France, uh, women's hockey at the end of the Second World War is actually outlawed by their, the, um, the, the Federation of Winter Sports as something that's not fitting for women to do. Wow. So really interesting story of how this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, 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 mushrooming of a culture in a couple of decades and then it's death. And until recently, a kind of amnesia has has come over us and we've forgotten about this. And so hopefully that's one of the things that that our chapter in this uh, book will do is to bring these stories back to the light. Fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we're nearing the end of the hour, we're, but fortunately we're getting Already? to the, Yeah, I know it goes by so fast, but fortunately uh, we're getting to the point where we get to make our suggestion, which I think everyone enjoys uh, listening to and, and making a suggestion. Uh, would you like to go first, Andy? 
Sure. Uh, if I have one suggestion to make, it would be for everybody who is interested in hockey or interested in Canadian history or interested in First Nations culture uh, or all three to read a book by Richard Wagamese, W-A-G-A-M-E-S-E, -E, called Indian Horse. Hmm. And uh, this was uh, a Canada Reads selection in 2013. Uh, by CBC on Radio 1, uh, and it's become uh, uh, widely embraced by Canadians and should be by others, I think, about a, a young boy who was uh, pulled from his family in the uh, 60s scoop, as the historians have now called it, mm. uh, taken away from his people, the uh, Ojibwe, and brought to a residential school where hockey becomes both uh, his uh, the bane of his existence as well as... Uh, uh, a source of liberation. I'll just leave it at that and hopefully uh, yeah. pick it up and have a read. That's a great suggestion and uh, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes so everyone can find that very easily. Um, my suggestion is also a book. Uh, it's a book that I read, um, you know, as was mentioned in our conversation, there there is a huge literature on hockey. It, it hasn't always been scholars or historians who have written it. But um, there's some excellent books out there. And I, I was just thinking, as I was sort of preparing for this podcast, I was thinking of a book I read in high school written by um, Jason Cohen called Zamboni Rodeo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in which he, he follows the, the Austin Ice Bats. And um, mm -hmm. he's very real about this sort of minor league hockey. And, and you get the sense of, of kind of what it's like for the people who don't make it to the big leagues, but but who want to keep going with it, for people who kind of play hockey in areas where it's where it's not so historically rooted, so it's and it, it, it's a very interesting read, and we'll link to that as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, and so of course I urge you all to check out Hockey: A Global History. Um, Andy Holman and Stephen Hardy did a fabulous job with it, and not only do you get all these little stories and these, you know, sort of un re rediscovered and in some cases for the first time discovered history, but you also get a sense of, of the, the enormous potential something like hockey has. So um, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right. On Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. Thanks for listening. Thanks again for listening. Make sure to check out ourofhistory.com forward slash Rex for all the recommendations mentioned during the show. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, be sure to head over to our blog at ourofhistory.com forward slash blog, where you'll find topics that were covered in the podcast as well as others. And that concludes this week's episode. We thank you again for listening, and we hope to have you back here next week at the Hour of History podcast. stickers <laughs> uh, who wants stickers hour of history podcast stickers if that you know piques your interest if, if you like sticking things <laughs> where they don't belong then go ahead and drop us a line go to hour of history.com forward slash contact and leave us your name your email address and your address and we'll pop some stickers in your mailbox hourofhistory.com forward slash contact on hour of history it's our world anytime any place <laughs>